Today we're going to be talking about the use of routine whole genome sequencing to improve investigation of listeriosis outbreaks. First, uh, we want to give a little bit of background on uh, Listeria monocytogenes, the pathogen that we're going to be talking about today. So Listeria is a gram-positive bacteria. There are three main serotypes of Listeria monocytogenes. It's a pathogen that's found commonly uh, in the environment in both soil and water. It can be tolerant to heat, salt, and alcohol. Um, and although it grows best at body temperature, it's still able to grow at refrigerator temperature and even survives in very cold environments, including liquid nitrogen, for long periods. It also readily forms biofilms, so an organism that has some characteristics that make it pose some unique challenges for food safety. The genome for Listeria monocytogenes is about 3 million base pairs. Uh, when we look at the core genome, um, it's made of about uh, a little less than 1,800 loci um, versus the whole genome, um, which is a little less than 5,000 loci. And overall, there's slow backbone evolution for Listeria monocytogenes. In terms of the epidemiology of Listeria in the United States, there are about 1,600 invasive uh, Listeria infections estimated to occur each year. Nearly all of those people are hospitalized, and it results in about 250 deaths annually. There are several groups that are higher risk for infection um, or serious illness when they do become infected. These include pregnant women and newborns, older adults, and immunocompromised persons. These invasive infections can cause a, a variety of, of bad outcomes. These include miscarriages and stillbirths in pregnant women, serious illness or death in newborns, and um, sepsis or meningitis in older adults. So the foodborne route of transmission was established for listeriosis um, in the 1980s. And in the, the following decade in the 1990s, um, the outbreaks and illnesses that were seen were primarily linked to deli meats and, and hot dogs. There were a series of, of high profile outbreak investigations linked to those types of food products. More recently though, we've seen different uh, types of foods linked to um, listeriosis outbreaks. Um, some recent examples here include the soft raw milk cheese outbreak from 2017, um, outbreaks in 2016 linked to frozen vegetables, raw milk, and prepackaged salads. In 2015, outbreaks linked to soft cheeses and ice cream. 2014, caramel apples, bean sprouts, soft cheese, and soft or semi-soft cheeses, and then again a soft cheese outbreak in 2013. So really a, a quite different set of outbreak vehicles than we saw um, at least early on when listeria was identified as a foodborne pathogen. We're going to describe a little bit about the Listeria Initiative, which is our surveillance system for listeriosis cases in the U.S. In 2004, CDC and the state started piloting the Listeria Initiative in food net sites. It was modeled after a similar program in France for prospectively interviewing listeriosis cases with a common set of questions. It expanded to nationwide in 2005, and the goal is to expedite identification of common food sources during listeriosis outbreak investigation. <clears throat> uh, the Listeria Initiative form, um, we worked with states and local health departments to develop the standard form that all jurisdictions use to interview case patients and includes clinical information and extensive food history. The food history includes several different categories. We ask questions about dietary restrictions and preferences, grocery stores and restaurants that are um, frequented by the patients, cheese and other dairy products, seafood, dips and spreads, fruit, vegetables and other produce, animal contact, deli meats and deli salads, and other meat and poultry. This form actually helps us um, in outbreak investigations with early hypothesis generation by rapidly identifying common foods among the ill people. Because ill people with sporadic disease are interviewed, that actually provides us controls for our case-case analytic methods. This is especially important for listeriosis because we have specific subpopulations. <clears throat> We're going to talk a little bit about the Listeria Whole Genome Sequencing Pilot Project. The objective and the participants of the project, um, were, we started with a three-year pilot project starting in September of 2013. The goal is to sequence all Listeria monocytogenes isolates in near real time, so like less than one week for our clinical or patient isolates. Uh, participants in the project were CDC, FDA, USDA, FSIS, 
National Center for Biotechnology Information, and the Association of Public Health Laboratories. So we focus on Listeria monocytogenes first for WGS because the illness is rare but serious. It's also costly and commonly outbreak associated. The current subtyping methods were not ideal. The genome is fairly small and it was relatively easy to sequence and analyze. And we had the strong epi component in the Listeria initiative, which we just spoke about, and a strong regulatory component from uh, both FDA and FSIS. <clears throat> So uh, about a year ago, we published a paper on the implementation of the nationwide whole genome sequencing project. Um, and it talks about uh, a couple of different things like timeliness of investigations and how we were able to solve investigations of, that had cases occurring over many years. And the references included here. <clears throat> so one of the great improvements about us using WGS is shown in this graph. So this shows seriosis outbreaks and incidents from 1983 to 2016. And the main point that we like to cover with this figure is that the incidence of listeriosis has gone down, while the number of outbreaks have been detected has increased, and also the median number of cases that are included in an outbreak has gone down to four since we started WGS. <clears throat> so whole genome sequencing has really improved the way we're able to detect outbreaks and that we're able to detect them when they're smaller. So this figure just shows the impact of WGS on mysterious outbreak investigations in another way. Shows the number of clusters that we were able to detect in three different periods. Um, the pre-WGS period, which was from September 2012 through August 2013, all the way through the end of the third year of the pilot project from September 2015 to August 2016. As you can see, the number of clusters that was detected has increased over time. Uh, the number of clusters that were detected sooner only by WGS has also increased over time. And the number of outbreaks that have solved have increased as well. But as you'll see, our median number of cases per cluster outbreak has decreased from six down to four. And we've been able to link more cases to a food source. So now we're going to talk a little bit about listeriosis cluster detection in the WGS era. So detecting outbreaks uh, with PulseNet using uh, originally PFGE <clears throat> uh, was, was sort of the main method we used. Um, and again, for Listeria, when it's an outbreak, um, when it causes outbreaks can be linked to commercially distributed products, it's really, really important for us to get subtyping information to be able to find those highly disseminated outbreaks and link different ill people together to investigate as a potential outbreak. So the PulseNet laboratory network was actually established in 1996, again, with this original um, pulse field gel electrophoresis or PFGE method of DNA fingerprinting. Um, now there are over 80 participating laboratories in the United States, including state health departments and, and state, and, uh, state and federal regulatory agencies. Uh, there are currently over 60,000 isolates subtyped annually. Um, that's not just listeria, that includes other pathogens like uh, sugar toxin producing E. coli and salmonella. So again, historically listeria collected from ill people would undergo fingerprinting using this PFGE technique. And the underlying assumption of the whole system was when listeria were found that had the same fingerprint, they were more likely at least to come from a common source, likely a food. So I wanted to spend a little time on the conceptual framework for PFGE. So if we um, look at this um, blue circle here, <coughs> excuse me, as a representation of the bacterial genome, PFGE um, creates several cut sites in that genome. And those cut sites, lead to genome fragments that are run across a gel that creates a barcode or a DNA fingerprint. So different strains are essentially determined um, by the number and location of cut sites and insertions and deletions of large segments of DNA. It's important to note that there are other lab workflows needed for serotype, um, virulence factors, and, and other things as well. So this is just one of many lab workflows. One thing to note also with PFGE is the diversity of strains across PFGE. So we looked in 2015 at the 573 isolates that were not part of recognized outbreaks. And there were actually 375 different PFGE pattern combinations. But 21 of those pattern combinations accounted for about 25% of the isolates. So while some um, DNA fingerprints were quite rare and very useful in identifying maybe who could be part of an outbreak, 
some of them were more common and had less discriminatory power to determine you know, whether people truly were in or out of an outbreak. So sequencing provides a much higher resolution view of the bacterial genome. So again, we had our, our cut sites leading to genome fragments and PFGE. With whole genome sequencing, this technique is really looking you know, directly at the genetic information at not necessarily every single position in the bacterial genome, but almost every single one. So WGS is giving us more direct information via the sequence uh, about um, the makeup of that bacteria and how related it is uh, phylogenetically to other bacteria, much greater resolution, much greater epidemiologic concordance, um, and again, things like serotype and virulence and other factors, um, those things can be identified directly out of the genome itself, so it's another workflow that isn't necessarily required to identify those characteristics. So how have we been defining listeria clusters in the, in the whole genome sequence era? So, um, you know, clearly we have to use both, you know, laboratory and epidemiologic data to make decisions about, um, you know, who we include in an outbreak, but we do need some rules of thumb to help guide at least our initial cluster detection efforts. So um, PulseNet uses a threshold for cluster detection of 25 allele differences uh, between bacteria. Uh, but we have found, though, that isolates within about 10 allele differences tend to have a higher likelihood of being linked to a common source. So when we focus on that sort of 10 allele range, um, that does pretty well. And then on the basis of epidemiologic and other factors, we can kind of expand from there. Um, so again, really just to highlight that allele differences really should be taken into context with the epidemiologic data. Um, so we've seen certainly instances where isolates that look pretty similar by whole genome sequencing may not at least have an obvious epidemiologic link. And also we've seen some outbreaks where the allele difference ranges um, have been larger than this um, 10 to even 25 allele difference range. So we define clusters as three or more closely related clinical isolates submitted to PulseNet within the last 120 days. And if a cluster of three or more isolates is identified in this time period, an entire database search um, is done in PulseNet to find any other potentially related isolates. And this would include both clinical and non-clinical isolates like food or environmental isolates. Those clusters are then reported to epidemiologists and posted to a listserv monitored by the PulseNet OutbreakNet network. Um, and these clusters are monitored weekly and compared by WGF, uh, WGMLST to any newly um, uploaded sequences um, during an ongoing investigation to identify possible new clusters or new illnesses associated with existing clusters. So this is a table um, from the paper that was mentioned earlier about um, implementation of whole genome sequencing for listeriosis. Um, and I think there's two things to highlight here. So um, this looks at several different outbreaks and compares um, the SNP difference, uh, the maximum SNP difference across outbreak-associated isolates, and the maximum allele difference across isolates. And one thing to note is that these two different methods, high-quality SNP analysis and whole genome MLST analysis, tend to have fairly concordant results in terms of either SNP or allele differences. So these two methods produce pretty uh, consistent uh, subtyping results. The other thing that you'll note, though, is that there are some outbreaks here where we do see uh, allele differences and SNP differences um, range up pretty high and even, even higher than this sort of 25 allele difference rule of thumb that, that we use. Um, so again, these were investigations where, um, you know, the outbreak was sort of expanded on the basis of, of epidemiologic data um, as we collected more information. So how has sequencing influenced outbreak investigations generally before we get into some specific examples? Well, I think the most important part is that it's really helped refine outbreak definitions. So it's helped us determine who's in and who's out of an outbreak investigation. It's helped us group isolates with different PFGE patterns into single clusters. So things that look like they weren't related actually were related when we looked by whole genome sequencing. It also has shown that some PFGE defined clusters were not real outbreaks. So the PFGE data wasn't quite specific enough, not discriminatory enough. It helped us solve some older cold case outbreaks. It certainly strengthens the link um, between clinical isolates and either food or environmental isolates that we see. So we have a much higher index of suspicion when we see food and, and clinical isolates together that are closely related by whole genome sequencing. It's also helped us understand the ecology of pathogen reservoirs in, in production environments. So we're going to focus on a couple of specific outbreak investigations today, uh, the ones highlighted here, and they're going to illustrate, I think, some of the ways that sequencing has impacted outbreak investigations. So the first one we're going to talk about is a listeriosis outbreak linked to gourmet soft cheeses. And this outbreak um, 
actually was the first reference um, in a public CDC outbreak web hosting of using whole genome sequencing in real time for a listeriosis outbreak. And so if you kind of dig down into this outbreak posting, there's a line that says the DNA fingerprinting of the outbreak strain is typically associated with about 14 cases per year, even in the absence of an outbreak, a recognized outbreak. For this reason, whole genome sequencing, a highly discriminatory subtyping method, was also used to define the outbreak strain. Whole genome sequencing helped clarify which patients' illnesses were related to the outbreak. So again, this uh, was an outbreak back in 2014, first time that we really used this um, in an outbreak investigation, or 2013, sorry. Um, so this is actually the whole genome sequence tree from this outbreak. And so uh, the tree shows a group of six closely related isolates down at the bottom of the tree in orange. Um, most of those ill patients had food history data that showed that they were exposed to the implicated cheese products in the outbreak. The other didn't have any food history information. Um, <clears throat> but it also helped exclude a couple of other concurrent isolates that had the same PFGE pattern. So you can see two other isolates listed in this tree in orange. Those happened again around that same time period in 2013, but the sequencing showed that those isolates were a bit different and there wasn't good epi support to include those. Finally, um, in blue, kind of close to the, the main outbreak clade in the bottom, we'll see two 2010 and 2011 isolates um, that look like they may have been part of that outbreak, at least by whole genome sequencing, but there wasn't a lot of good epidemiologic data to say whether or not those isolates uh, were or were not in the outbreak investigation. So those um, at least remain suspicious as being potentially linked uh, to the same producer, but, but never confirmed. So how did whole genome help or complicate in this outbreak investigation? Well, this was a pretty classic one where it really helped refine our case definition and strengthen that epi link to cheese. So it helped rule out um, some, some illnesses uh, that looked like they could have been um, related, excluding uh, some other states, uh, potentially from being in the outbreak investigation. Um, and again, this relationship that we saw between some older isolates with limited epi data and the current outbreak at least left an implication that there could have been a resident pathogen in the facility for a longer time period. Again, not necessarily proven on the basis of that data, but at least was a little suspicious for that potentially happening. So now we're going to talk a little bit about the listeriosis outbreak that was linked to caramel apples. So the outbreak was identified by two listeriosis illness clusters around the same time. Cluster one was located in Arizona and New Mexico, and, and they contacted us regarding an increase in listeriosis cases in both states. Second cluster was identified by PulseNet, um, and then four listeriosis cases in Minnesota and Missouri, so geographically different from cluster one. So we had to determine whether we were working on one outbreak or two. The whole genome sequencing results showed that there was a close relationship among the isolates in each of those clusters, but the two clusters were genetically unrelated at over 1,500 allele differences. The illnesses in both clusters were occurring during the same time period, and there were five states with illnesses that were included in both clusters. Finally, we had a child that had both strains from two different specimen sources, so a strain from cluster one and a strain from cluster two. So this is just a map of those cases where you can see some overlap, where you can see cases that were in single cluster one is in the yellow color, cases that were just included in cluster two and the red, and then states that had uh, cases in both clusters and the ones with the yellow and the orange stripes. So we did end up combining them into one cluster, but as you can see from the whole genome sequencing results, we had 50 isolates that were sequenced. These were isolates from uh, clinical isolates from ill people. We had isolates from a uh, grower for food contact surfaces for the apples, packing line floor, and apples collected without throughout the distribution chain. And among those isolates, they did fall into two distinct whole genome sequencing clades that we mentioned when we discussed the clinical clusters. And each of those contained closely related clinical isolates and food environmental isolates. Some of those illnesses would have been difficult to rule in without using whole genome sequencing. One of the PFG patterns that was included, as you can see, there are a couple of different PFG patterns, uh, was quite common. It would have been really difficult for us to tease this out without using whole genome sequencing. So how did WGS help us or, or complicate this investigation? So initially, WGS showed no relationship between the two clusters until we identified the child with those strains, the clusters were investigated separately. 
but it did help us in identifying that apple and environmental isolates fell into both whole genome sequencing clades, so we could confidently say that illnesses were caused by the same source. So the next example we're going to talk about is a listeriosis outbreak linked to Middle Eastern style soft cheeses. So this investigation started in December 2013 when PulseNet identified a PFGE defined cluster of four uh, illnesses that had a rare PFGE pattern. So there are two in California, one in Illinois and one in Massachusetts. And <clears throat> these illnesses that occurred um, all throughout the, the second half of 2013. All four patients at least appeared to be of Middle Eastern descent, uh, at least based on their names. Um, and two patients were interviewed with a supplemental form. Um, but there really wasn't a, a common food that was able to be identified amongst the, that small number of cases. And so that cluster was closed pretty soon after in January 2014. Well, unfortunately, in August 2015, um, this looks like it sort of came back. So PulseNet identified a cluster of 12 cases with a different PFGE pattern from the initial one, uh, but it was also a rare one. Again, we saw cases in California, as well as Massachusetts, New York, and, Cal uh, and Colorado. Specimen collection dates, at least for this PFGE pattern, ranged a fairly long time period from 2013 through 2015. Um, and 10 sequenced isolates that we had at the time were within 25 allele differences by whole genome MLST. More whole genome sequence analysis ended up showing that isolates from an even longer time period, from 2010 to 2015, with four different PFGE patterns, were also highly related to one another, including isolates from that initial 2013 cluster. So sequencing really tied a lot of different PFGE patterns together. So, when all of these illnesses were sort of rolled together into one investigation, we still saw this strong Middle Eastern connection present, many people with, with Middle Eastern last names. We saw soft cheeses associated with illness, and when people specified the type of soft cheese, it was mostly Middle Eastern and Mediterranean style soft cheeses. And we at least had a suspicion that a single company was involved based on some of the brands that were being reported by ill, Ill persons. Um, what we also found in PulseNet that there were five matching environmental isolates from that same suspect company. Um, it was a cheese production facility, um, and those actually had been collected in 2010. So this is a, a picture of the whole genome sequence tree. Um, I'm going to highlight here um, the first and second enzymes for the PFGE patterns, and you can see just what a wide array of different PFGE pattern combinations were included in the outbreak investigation. You can see that this entire tree here is within 26 allele differences. So even though there's a little bit of subgrouping within the tree, the whole group actually seems quite closely related genetically. And we also, again, have those several um, initial environmental isolates that were collected that fell into that tree as well, right in with the clinical isolates. So how did sequencing help or complicate in this outbreak investigation? Well, again, it really tied together a lot of these different PFGE pattern combinations. Um, and showed that they were actually the same strain, likely coming from the same place. And it also really helped us build the case that these clinical environmental isolates that we saw over this long five-year period were all really connected to one issue, and that there was likely a harborage issue within that cheese production facility that had extended for quite a long period. Okay, so the last full outbreak example we're going to talk about is the listeriosis outbreak linked to bagged salads. So the cluster was initially identified that included two PFG pattern combinations and also some isolates from cheese and spinach. All of the isolates were considered closely related within 31 allele differences. There was a single PFG pattern combination that was previously linked to stone fruits and caramel apples, but the isolates differed by WGMLST. Exposure data was needed to determine whether the illnesses were caused by either stone fruits, caramel apples, cheese, or leafy greens. So our initial whole genome sequencing analysis is included here, and you can see there's isolates from cheese and baby spinach, and those showed some clustering by WGS with some clinical isolates dating back to 2013. And you can see at the bottom, the range actually for this whole tree was up to 51 allele differences with a median of 14. Now I'm highlighting these two isolates here, and we'll talk about those on the next slide, but these two isolates are very closely related to each other. So these are the same two isolates that were on the previous slide. And as you can see from this whole tree, we've got, we've, this whole section has sort of expanded from the previous tree. And the initial isolates that had cheese and leafy greens associated with them are included at the top, while this main 
uh, part of the tree that's in the middle is included in, in what we considered our bagged salad outbreak clinical cases. So there were no exposure information uh, on the Listeria questionnaire that reported any, anything more significant than what we expected. Our supplemental questionnaire that was administered to all cases included foods previously associated with the PFG pattern. And then the outbreak wave four out of five reported leafy green consumption. We moved to open-ended interviews um, after we did the, our initial supplemental data, and we found that leafy greens were reported by eight out of eight patients, six out of eight reported spinach, and seven out of eight reported romaine specifically. We had uh, six out of eight reported specifically packaged salad, and then we had two people who reported a specific brand and variety of those. So this is our final whole genome sequencing tree for the investigation. And we did find that the isolates were highly related um, to each other, the clinical isolates, and also to, to some Canadian isolates by whole genome sequencing. And then we had to, um, some food isolates that were interspersed in there. So the whole tree itself um, ranged by uh, zero to 16 alleles with by a median of three. So and then for leafy green consumption for the entire cluster, we had leafy greens reported by 16 out of 16 cases. Romaine was the highest um, by 13 out of 16 cases. And packaged salad was specifically reported by 13 out of 14. And for those that we had brand information, all of them had brands um, that were came from the same facility A. So this is just a map of our cases. Um, as you can see, Facility A was located in Ohio, and the clinical cases were all surrounding that, which was consistent with the distribution from that facility. So WGS um, initially complicated our investigation because we were including isolates that were unrelated, even though they were within the 25 allele differences. So thinking about that tree that we talked about where we had cheese and leafy greens, and then that expanded portion with the clinical cases that um, were uploaded when we, after we started the investigation. But it also helped us by helping us to link cases from Canada and food and environmental isolates that were collected from both Canada and the U.S. So we're going to talk a little bit about some unsolved difficult outbreak examples, and this is a for, for WGS, so there's a few things that can help, that can complicate or, or give us some challenges for our investigations. First, it can be difficult for us to determine which isolates should be included in an investigation. And even though there are isolates within the 25 allele difference, they may not share a common source as shown in the previous outbreak example. Conversely, some well-defined outbreaks have had allele ranges exceeding 30 allele differences. Sequencing also requires more time for completion and can vary between days to weeks, which potentially delays identification of isolates to include in clusters. Finally, sequencing alone does not solve outbreaks. Complete epidemiologic data is needed to ultimately link cases to a food source. So this WGS tree shows 11 clinical isolates and a food isolate with iso and five food isolates with isolation dates ranging from September 2014 to February of 2018. The food isolates came from products produced at five different facilities with no apparent relationship to each other. Exposure data suggested that patients did eat similar types of products, but did not specifically report any of the food items included in the tree. So even though whole genome sequencing suggested these patients and foods are likely all related, we couldn't confidently say that there's a relationship between them based on available epi data. So the next one we want to talk about is an outbreak with a suspected link to meat products. So this is just describing that a little bit further. So food isolates that were identified from products produced at five different slaughter processing facilities that had no apparent relationship to each other. And the, exposure, the exposure data suggested that the patients generally ate the types of products made by these facilities, but not specifically re reporting any of the food items included in the WGS tree. So even though we know that these patients and foods are likely are related by whole genome sequencing, we can't confirm a relationship between any of them. So this tree shows seven clinical isolates and one environmental isolate that are all highly related by a range of zero to six allele differences, suggesting that the facility that's included with the environmental isolate could be linked to these illnesses. <clears throat> 
The clinical isolates were from patients residing in multiple states. Um, so as a result, the, the, the environmental isolate from the food firm produced fresh rice noodles. Five of those patients reported consuming Asian-style foods or shopping at Asian markets. But what we found as we were continuing to investigate is that the rice noodle producer did not distribute outside of the local area, and the ingredient testing from the firm did not yield any listeria monocytogenase. So this showed us that there's a related food or environmental isolate, but it's not always the source of infection for patients with related isolates. So this tree shows multiple clinical isolates from a single state isolated in multiple years. There are two different PFG pattern combinations are included with the majority of isolates having the primary pattern combination. The allele differences for the entire tree go up to 58, but you'll note that some of the nodes on the tree in the allele range is 25 or less, and a couple of nodes are even smaller. The question we have is whether these are sporadic or, or cluster-related illnesses. So this is an example of how difficult it is to determine it or define the outbreak itself. So for PFG, it showed that the majority of isolates of a single PFG pattern were from clinical cases in a single state. The clusters were investigated over multiple years. Whole genome sequencing results showed a broader range of allele differences from 1 to 58, but there was a closer, if you looked at the clades individually, some that were closely related. The temporal and geographic clustering suggested that all isolates could be related. However, a source was unable to be identified from available epi data. So this could be a number of small outbreaks or actually not a cluster at all. So just a few conclusions and, and final thoughts about future directions for listeria sequencing. So some of the emerging trends we've, we've seen as we've turned whole genome sequencing on. Um, well, since 2013, there have been a lot of novel outbreak vehicles that have been identified, and in a lot of those outbreaks, sequencing played a pretty prominent role. Um, we spoke a bit about the caramel apple outbreak. Um, a major outbreak that we didn't highlight in this talk was one linked to ice cream <clears throat> over a, a multi-year period, uh, outbreak linked to frozen vegetables as well, which was quite, quite complex, and then again, the bag salad outbreak that uh, we spoke about here. So a lot of vehicles that we didn't really traditionally think about um, as, as Listeria outbreak vehicles. It wasn't sort of like deli meats and cheeses, um, like we've sort of thought about Listeria historically. Um, we do still continue to see outbreaks linked to cheese. So unlike deli meats, <clears throat> where outbreaks have really trailed off quite a bit um, in recent years, we do continue to see outbreaks linked to cheese, and those have primarily been from domestically produced pasteurized milk cheeses. Um, and again, we really have seen this notable absence of, of hot dog and deli meat outbreaks. Recently, um, there have been a few small ones that we've uh, identified recently, but overall, you know, nothing like it was, and I think really speaks to a lot of the control measures that were implemented in, in those industries. One of the other things that investigating these outbreaks has really began to highlight is sort of the, the changing notion of sporadic illness. So these are the epi curves for the couple of the outbreaks that I actually mentioned in the previous slides. So the one on the top, was the outbreak linked to frozen vegetables. There were nine illnesses over a three-year period. The bottom one was, again, the, the ice cream outbreak, 10 illnesses over a five-year period. And, you know, these illnesses really aren't sporadic in the way that we've, we've talked about them before. I right? you know sporadic sort of implies that they're, they kind of happen randomly and there isn't a cause. Um, but these are investigations that showed that there, there was a link, that they did link to a common source. And so I think we'd argue that sequencing is showing that these are really examples of sort of the endemic disease that has historically happened year after year um, that wasn't previously at least identified as an outbreak, but now we're starting to connect those illnesses together. So PulseNet um, is no longer performing PFGE analysis on Listeria isolates. The, that stopped in January of 2018, so it's now been almost a year where we've been using whole genome sequencing only for Listeria. Um, we do think we need to continue to evaluate the time window over which we, we look uh, for outbreaks and the allele ranges that we use for cluster detection. We've clearly seen many outbreaks that um, have illnesses that fall far, far outside of our traditional 120-day window. Um, and again, I think getting the right balance of an allele range that's specific enough to know that the illnesses are likely connected to a common source, but large enough to make sure that we kind of capture everyone can be a, a difficult balance, so we'll have to continue to look at the data that we collect there from outbreaks. I think we also will want to continue to work closely uh, 
to make sure that we're linking um, epidemiologic data uh, to whole genome sequence data and closer to real time to make sure that when we identify sequence or sequence-based clusters that we have as much epi data as possible to really jump on it. And the reason this is so important is uh, as we noted earlier, the size of outbreaks has sort of been going down over time with whole genome sequencing. And again, that may be because we're excluding some illnesses, that may be that we're getting to the source earlier, but it basically means that we have less to work with. Um, so if we only have four illnesses in an outbreak and there's only epi data for two people, that really doesn't provide a, a whole lot of, of threads to pull on to get to a source. And then finally, allele codes have recently been implemented for Listeria um, to help characterize WGS results in a way that's a little bit more um, easily queryable by epidemiologists and others that might not um, have access to um, bioinformatics software. So um, allele codes essentially are a form of nomenclature, and so we can kind of think of them uh, a little bit like a PFGE pattern name. So it's just an alphanumeric code that um, tells us that isolates that sort of share that code um, look to be similar genetically. And so allele codes are built on the percent similarity uh, between the core genomes um, of isolates. And again, um, this allele code is created uh, based on that core genome data to create this thing that essentially is a pattern name. And we'll, we'll show what these look like in the next slide. And so we can use these names for cluster detection by knowing how related isolates are based on their name. And we'll show again in the next slide that names can be complete or partial, depending upon how they fall in our tree and how the nomenclature was built. Um, and again, this is what we're going to go through here is just for listeria. Um, the thresholds that, that will be used in allele codes for other organisms, like Salmonella and Aztec, may differ a little bit. So the allele code thresholds are really built for listeria to create the most stable nomenclature possible. Those cutoffs, again, might be different for other organisms. So this slide um, at the top shows what an allele code for listeria actually looks like. So in the box at the top, um, you can see a long string of, of numbers and letters. Um, the beginning of that code starts LMO 1.0, and so that code basically tells you that we're dealing with listeria monocytogenes, and we're dealing with version 1.0 of the allele codes. <clears throat> and then each of the digits that follows tells you how close that isolate is to others based on how many of the letters in that code um, are shared. And it's, it's hierarchical. So basically, if two isolates just share that first five, it means they're within 71 alleles of each other. If they share both the five and the first one, they're within 51. And we can move all the way out. Two isolates that have the same six digits in their allele code actually have zero allele differences between one another. Um, so one thing to note is that when there are partial names, so there'll be times where maybe there's only four digits for an allele code, that basically just means that there aren't any, any other isolates that are any closer um, than that threshold that you stop. So the LMO 1.0, uh, 5.1.2.2, .2, that just means that there aren't any additional isolates that are closer to that than 19 alleles, which is that fourth threshold. So whole genome sequencing has already improved our ability to detect, triage, and investigate uh, and solve outbreaks of Listeria monocytogenes infections. So we found more outbreaks. We've been identifying when they've been smaller. We can start those investigations with better leads, and that could be being more confident that the illnesses are linked to a common source, or it could be that we get some clues from food and environmental isolates that are closely related. Um, and hopefully this better information is going to stop those outbreaks sooner become they be before they become really big and catastrophic. So the 2011 outbreak linked to cantaloupes, which caused uh, a very large number of illnesses and hospitalizations and deaths is the exact kind of situation that we really want to avoid. The other thing to note too is that the vast majority of listeriosis cases in the U.S. are still not linked to a known outbreak. So a relatively small fraction of all the listeria illnesses uploaded to PulseNet <clears throat> are associated with a known outbreak. And so some of the next steps in preventing illnesses will really need to be targeting the things that looked previously at least to be sporadic illnesses. So I think that will be an area where we hope to make a lot of progress.